the Graphic Environment Operating System, or more commonly, GEOS, was released by Berkeley Softworks in 1986. GEOS is a classic Mac-like graphical user interface that manages to offer a lot of functionality of the original and expensive Macintoshes. The difference is, it was created to work with an affordable computer that you might have heard of, the Commodore 64, a 1 MHz computer with only 64 kilobytes of RAM. Originally, GEOS was built to be an innovative experience found in the backs of airplane seats called SkyTray, but that project was canceled right as the software was being completed. Berkeley Softworks had built GEOS to run on 6502 CPU base machines. The 6502 was almost identical to the C64 CPU, which was already in millions of North American homes. So, in a pivot, they initially ported GEOS to the best-selling computer of all time. In the 1980s, the Macintosh began to dominate the desktop publishing world for a price. GEOS brought world-class word processing and productivity software to the affordable Commodore 64 in a way C64 users had never seen before. At its peak, thanks to Commodore bundling GEOS with its C64C computers, GEOS was for a time the second most widely used graphical user interface in the world, next to Mac OS. Today I'm gonna to show you my favorite setup using period correct hardware and software to create the ultimate GEOS battle station, as if we were back in 1989. To start, Let's say hello to the Commodore 128D CR. Beyond having a sturdy metal case that never yellows, the 128D CR came with an internal 1571 disk drive, a 1 to 2 megahertz CPU, and double the RAM of the Commodore 64. The fact is, in order to use GEOS effectively, you really need to use a RAM expansion unit. This is going to both speed up GEOS as well as provide a virtual RAM disk, which I'll explain more about later. We also want to use a monitor that can support 80 columns. So I'm going to use an original Commodore CRT, refurbished by Ray Carlson in 2020, the 1902A. We are also going to be using the Cadillac of 8-bit Commodore drives, the gorgeous 1581 disk drive. A single 1581 disc can hold almost five times that of a 1541 disc. With just a couple of discs, I can have virtually all of the GEOS software I'll ever need, and at pretty respectable speeds. Finally, a Commodore 1351 mouse to get us around the screen. Yes, this does look a lot like an Amiga tank mouse, but the two mice aren't compatible. It also looks exactly like the 1350 mouse, but you want to avoid that one, since it only provides janky joystick movements. The 1351 is the way to go. And now we're cruising like Don Johnson in Miami Vice, like it's 1989. Here's how it all comes together. My internal 1571 is set to drive 8. I have a custom switch on my C128D a friend of mine made that allows me to easily flip the internal drive from 8 to 9, which is extremely handy. My 1581 is set to drive 9. I have the Commodore 1750 REU plugged in, which I have also set as a drive in GEOS, which you'll see in a minute. And it's all being pumped through the 1902A monitor in beautiful 80 column mode. In 1986, GEOS for the C64 was born. In 1987, Berkeley Softworks created GEOS 128 to take advantage of the C128's extra horsepower and higher screen resolution. 1987 is also when the C128D was born. In 1988, they released GEOS 2.0 for the Commodore 64, and finally, in 1989, GEOS 128.2.0 for the Commodore 128. The C128 was discontinued by Commodore in 1989, but several innovative companies weren't ready to give up on it just yet. Today's focus right now is on GEOS 128 2.0, which can take advantage of the C128's enhanced burst mode in conjunction with the 1571 and 1581 drives. 
Combining the obvious speed boost with an RU and 80 column mode graphics, we've got a very powerful productivity machine here. For even more performance, you can create or buy a 32 kilobyte ROM chip designed specifically to speed up the boot process and task switching operations on the Commodore C128. This ROM can be installed into the internal function ROM slot U36, which shipped empty and ready for use. Now let's go for a test drive so I can show you how this all comes together. Okay, now that we're at the desktop, here's why I love this setup so much. By starting Geos this way, my RU can now be used as a very fast emulated 1571 RAM disk. And since we booted off the 1581 on drive 9, that leaves my internal 1571 empty and ready for use should I want to load more programs, which are most commonly found in that format. Geos can only really use two drives at a time, what it calls Drive A and Drive B. This allows me to easily use my RAM disk as one of those two drives. If I really wanted a crazy speed enhancement, I could move my programs off the already fast 1581 over to the RAM expansion unit and load things from there. On top of that, the RAM link can take Geos to a whole new level, especially if I upgrade to wheels. But that's a fascinating topic for another day and why I'm focusing more on the common REU and what was available in 1989. Once I had all of this set up, I used my Zoom floppy to migrate really cool software I found online over to a 1541 disk which I then easily copied to my 1581 program and work disks. If you're really interested in setting up a machine like this yourself, there are a lot of fantastic books, sites, and videos out there that explain how to do it. And honestly, the original manuals are superb in discussing how to do it. But if I can do it, guys, honestly, anyone can. And once you get past that, it's all about exploring all of the cool software that was made for this operating system. And the truth is, one of the best programs is the built-in word processor, GeoWrite. It's a very nicely done program that, like a lot of old word processors, you type in a main window, then view a print preview you need to render before deciding to print. The only downside with all of this is many GIOS programs were written with the C64 in mind, meaning they won't have an 80 column version. Thus, you have to flip flop between screen modes to use those programs, but it's not really that bad, to be honest. If you're gonna go through all this trouble setting up a Geos machine, you kinda of wanna have a printer set up too. Surprisingly, in 2022, that's where Geos sometimes falls down. The original operating systems came with several period correct printer drivers. And over the years, some folks in the community have written several more. The problem most commonly seen, however, was in scaling. A lot of printers had difficulty scaling the text and graphics Geos created and produced jaggy results. However, a few printers did produce prints that even a Macintosh fan would have found impressive. This would have been either an HP PCL, which sold for $3,000 back in the day, or an Apple LaserWriter printer 
which cost $7,000 back in the day, more than $17,000 in today's dollars. My God. The funny thing is, these printers cost way more than the entire computer setup, but they produced extremely professional results from your Commodore 64 and 128. But you don't have to settle for trying to print on a finicky and obsolete 35-year-old printer. Hell no, you don't. You can convert your beautiful manuscripts to a, quote, telecommunication safe format, and then bring them over to your PC or Amiga. Here's how you do it. So guys, how do you use Geos in 2022? Let me know down in the comments your favorite systems and your favorite setups. So remember guys, keep that Geos and C128 love flowing, and we'll see you next time.